you have seen now in many videos so far in this section that the frequency resolution, so the number of frequency points that you get, corresponds to the number of time points in the signal. So we saw that with the loop in the Fourier transform, the loop that goes over the different frequencies and computes the dot product with the signal. And you also saw that a few videos ago with the explanation of the perfection of the Fourier transform and why we need to have n frequencies, each corresponding to n time points, in order to get an n by n square matrix that is invertible. Okay, so now I'm going to talk in this video about modifying the frequency resolution when you need to and that's done through something called zero padding. So this is just a brief reminder that the number of frequencies, the number of sine waves that we construct in the Fourier transform is a product of n or is determined by n where n is the length of the signal. This is the number of time points you have in your signal. And that we also see here, so we have the reconstructed vector of frequencies in hertz, and that goes from zero to Nyquist in n over two plus one steps. So the implication of this is that if you have a signal that has a relatively few, a, a small number of time points, so you don't have so many time points in your signal, the frequency bounds are fixed they are fixed at the low end by zero, and they are fixed at the upper, upper bound, the upper limit, by the Nyquist frequency. Now, I'm going to talk in a moment about changing the sampling rate, but for now, assume for the next few slides, assume that we have a signal with a fixed sampling rate, so we are not changing the sampling rate. All we're doing is taking shorter or longer segments of that signal. So here we have a short signal with only a few time points, and that means we have pretty sparse frequency sampling here. Now imagine what happens if we take more time points from that same signal. So we just take a longer data segment. Well, n is now higher, so zero hasn't changed. The Nyquist frequency hasn't changed because we still have the same sampling rate, but we have more points between zero and Nyquist, so the frequency resolution is higher. And now we can take this to an even more extreme. We can take an even longer segment of data, again, keeping the sampling rate the same. So now we have, this is a technical term here, buckets of time points, multiple buckets that we have to carry around. Lots and lots of time points. And that gives us a very fine frequency resolution. So a lot of frequency points between zero and Nyquist. So what this means is that the frequency resolution is determined by the number of time points. Now, you might have already been guessing, and I've already mentioned something about the sampling rate. So it is also true that if you have a relatively small number of time points, you have sparse frequency resolution. And then if you change the sampling rates, so let's say you downsample the data, but keep the number of time points the same, that is actually going to increase the frequency resolution because you have the same number of frequency points, frequency bins, but the Nyquist is now lower. So those get packed into a smaller area. So this is also true. So it's also true that the frequency resolution is determined by the sampling rate. However, in real practical data analysis, it is generally the case that once you sample your data, once you record the data, you don't often change the sampling rate. So you do a bunch of different analyses and you typically keep the sampling rate the same. So therefore, this is the right way to think about it, that the frequency resolution is determined by the number of time points. So what do you do if you wanna have more frequencies between zero and Nyquist? Let's say, this is you know, as big of a, of a, as long of a segment as you can take, but you really wanna get this frequency here because this frequency is important for your experiment for whatever reason. Perhaps this is the frequency that you are flickering a light and you wanna see the exact light frequency uh, represented in the brain. So what can you do if you cannot just arbitrarily cut longer segments? What you can do is a procedure called zero padding. So as you might guess from the name, 
what we do in zero padding is pad the signal with zeros. So that looks like this. Here is our original signal. It's just a little hill, but uh, this is the original signal. And what I've done here is zero pad. So I've added a bunch of zeros to the end of the signal. So here the signal is 20 points long. Here the signal is 40 points long. So now it has twice as many points. And that means that when we take the Fourier transform of this, this signal, it's going to have twice the frequency resolution as this signal. Of course, we are still going to start with zero hertz and we are still going to go up to the same Nyquist frequency because we're not changing the sampling rate, we are just adding more data points. And here is the important note that when you zero pad, you always add the zeros after the signal. You don't add them before the signal. You don't interspace the, you know, the signal with zeros in here. It would give you some funny looking signal. You always put the zeros after the signal. This can be a little bit confusing because when I talk about time domain convolution in the next section of the course, we are going to be discussing zero padding both before and after. So with the Fourier transform for zero padding for increased spectral resolution, you always zero pad afterwards. Fortunately, you, gen you don't really do the zero padding manually. You let MATLAB do it for you in the FFT function and you'll get to see that later. So why do we add zeros and not some other number? Well, the idea is that a zero is not containing any additional information about this signal. So we're just adding nothing to the end. Now, there's a bit of a philosophical debate to be had about whether adding zeros is really adding nothing. Because here, in fact, we have no idea what happens after time point 20. So from time point 21 to time point 40, we have literally no clue whatsoever what is going on with this signal because we didn't measure it out here. And here what we are doing is assuming that the signal has zeros out here. So in some sense, we are actually adding information that there is nothing happening here. Nonetheless, this is the mechanism of zero padding to increase frequency resolution. So this slide shows how to zero pad. The question is why would you zero pad? What are the motivations for zero padding in practical data analysis? There are in fact three motivations for zero padding your signals in the Fourier transform. One of which I already mentioned, and that is to obtain a specific frequency in the Fourier transform. So again, just to go back to this slide, so imagine this resolution is the highest you can get with the data segment that you have, but maybe it's really important for you to get exactly this frequency here. Now the thing is, based on the raw segment that you have, the original data segment, you don't have any way of knowing what was going on here. So what you do is add zeros to the end of the signal and that allows for more frequencies, more sine waves to be constructed. So that is one motivation for zero padding. Another motivation, which is actually the third, is just to smooth the spectral plots. And here it turns out that as you add more and more zeros, you're basically interpolating the spectrum. So you're just making the spectrum look a little bit smoother. It tends to look a little bit nicer. So for visual quality, for facilitating visual inspection, people will zero pad their signal in the Fourier transform. The second reason here, the second motivation for zero padding is to match the FFT lengths for convolution. Now, if you're not already familiar with the mechanisms of convolution, and in particular, the convolution theorem, then this statement probably doesn't make any sense whatsoever. That's totally fine. You can just pin this in the back of your brain and we will come back to it in the next section. But essentially what we want to do in convolution is take the Fourier transform of two different time series and then in the frequency domain, we want to multiply their Fourier spectra frequency by frequency. And so for that operation to be valid, their spectra need to have the same lengths. They need to match up in all of the frequencies. So then it becomes necessary to zero pad your two signals to make sure that they have the same length, the same frequencies in the frequency domain. Again, I will talk a lot more about this idea 
in the next section of the course. So here you go, three reasons for zero padding, and the mechanism is always that you add zeros to the end of the signal like this.